Dr. Ben Glocker is from Imperial College London, where he is a reader in machine learning for imaging. Uh, he studied, he did his PhD in uh, Munich. Uh, afterwards, he followed up with a postdoc in Microsoft and also a fellowship in Cambridge University. Um, and he focuses his research basically in the, his research is in the intersection of machine learning and medical imaging and aims to build computational tools for improving image-based detection and diagnosis of imaging of disease. Uh, thank you for being here. The microphone is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to join this uh, very nice workshop. Uh, I, I didn't have the chance to join the whole day because we did a run our tutorial at the same time. And you can maybe tell from my voice that it suffered a little bit. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, but but I'm 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 very delighted to tell you a little bit about my or our thoughts uh, uh, about robust machine learning, which really seems to be now in everyone's mind. Uh, really, I think um, if you look at what what has been published at Mikai, uh, the Dart workshop uh, being run for the second time. Also, what the, what was discussed in the other keynotes at the main conference, I think all alludes to this uh, point that people have realized that we have wonderful models that do work really well if we look at a very narrow and well-defined uh, application and data set. But we do run into troubles when we when we try to bring it into the real world and uh, when data changes. So here I'm talking a little bit about this quest towards robust machine learning, and I, I, I will. Um, discuss a little bit like work we have done in the past. So this is heavily biased by work uh, that, that my team has been doing. Um, but I also try to allude a little bit to like where, where we could go uh, in future. Uh, these are just some disclosures and not so much to do with this talk. Uh, so, so I want to start with this uh, slide that I have used in the past <clears throat> to illustrate a, a problem that I think is it's probably one of the like biggest problems that everyone is facing at the moment. And, and I don't think we have at the moment a very good solution to that problem. And that is about how do we make sure that in a, in a setting where we use things like deep learning, where we basically take the human out of the loop of defining the features that we extract from our data, but we want to learn those features. How do we make, make, make sure that we learn the right features? And what I mean with this is if we, if we do train a model on a data set like this, uh, for instance, to classify whether these little objects here are showing signs of malignancy or whether they are benign. We just throw them into, let's say, a neural network, and we hope that after uh, optimizing our loss function that we pick up features that, that can do the task and that they can do the task if we get new data. Unfortunately, uh, very often on new data, things might have changed a little bit. So just, just like graphically here illustrated, the color of these objects has changed, but not the shape. So the, the, the discriminative feature in terms of malignancy is shape. However, on the first training data set, there was nothing that I would tell my network to go for shape rather than color. Now, if you think about those two features, color is probably much easier to pick up. Uh, if you think about a convolutional neural network, a simple filter can pick up the intensity uh, values of pixels. And, and that might be the feature that is easier to learn. So there's this notion that came up, for instance, in this paper recently. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I, I believe. There's this notion of shortcut learning. And I think this is basically what's happening at the moment. Uh, if you train a neural network naively on your data, you will learn uh, so-called shortcuts. And they will not generalize well to new data. So how can we tell a neural network to look for a certain type of feature, but not for something else? Now this actually happens in the real world. So we did a little little experiment um, where we looked at brain MRI. Uh, so what we tried to do here is to basically simulate a little bit uh, with real data and, and a neuroimaging study that's somewhat ideal in a sense that we took data sets or brain MRI from two different studies, CAMCAN and UK Biobank. And we did age and sex matching on the subject. So we ended up with uh, 296 subjects per side. And the imaging protocol is relatively similar between the two. So if you look at, this, the, proto, at the parameters of the MRI uh, uh, protocol, they are somewhat similar. And they are not identical, but they are probably as close as you can get if you do multi-site. Plus the age and sex matching should really remove um, most of the uh, population differences. 
And then we did uh, standard pre-processing, uh, we did start skyscraping stripping bias field correction, uh, registration to MNI space, uh, intensity normalization. We did also run some standard SPM methods and neuroimaging toolkits to extract tissue maps. So just looking at the images after pre-processing, there are not obvious visual differences. So if you look at the scans and you might do visual quality control, you might say, good, I've harmonized my data. Histograms look similar, images look similar. Segmentations look similar. So these are the MNI normalized gray matter maps. There's not really a difference between the two rows coming from two different sides. And now you run a classifier. And the classifier's goal is to learn where the data is coming from. And this classifier can tell you with like almost perfect accuracy where the data is coming from on the, on the raw MRI, but also on the segmentation. So these gray matter maps that I just showed you. If you just take them as they are rigid uh, in the in the rigid um, space, the the accuracy drops. Uh, it goes down from 96 to to 80. So so they are becoming a little bit more um, standardized across sides. Interestingly, if you say if you take the same gray matter maps as they come out of SPM and you use the ones that are mapped to MNI space, the accuracy of telling where the data is coming from goes up to 96 percent again. So how how is that possible? Uh, so this was quite striking. Now, if you dig a little bit further, so we did another experiment on this. Uh, we wanted to have a proper task, right? So, so telling where the data is coming from is one thing, but does it matter? What about we have a task? So here we had only a proxy task. So let's say sex classifications. We wanted to tell whether these are from like biological sex, male or female brains. And you can do this if you do multi-site age and sex match, you get 80%. If you do it on a single site, you get around 80%. So that's the accuracy you can get in terms of sex classification. Now, if you have a slight mismatch between your um, two sites, let's say you take all the females from Camp and all the males from the UK Biobank, you get a crazy accuracy of telling 95% uh, whether it's male or female, but obviously now the, it's just picking up where the data is coming from, right? So it's going back to the accuracy we saw earlier. More realistically, typically you would have these uh, slight imbalances between sites. Let's say your patients are coming from one side, but you get some controls there, and then you get a lot of controls from somewhere else. You're biasing your data set in a way that you know might report over the overly optimistic performance on disease classification, right? Also interesting, if you train on one side, test on the other. Now in this setting, not much changes, right? Just training on, on CAMCAN and testing on UK Bioring, we still get 80%. And this is data that is just rigidly aligned. Now, if you think about sex classification and rigid alignment of brains, there's one very dominant feature that you can pick up, which is uh, overall uh, brain size, which is different between uh, female and male. So, so this can be picked up. Interestingly, if we take the same data, but FND registered to MNI, the performance drops much more if you train on one side and, on, and test on the other. Why? Because you're removing this most discriminative feature of brain size. Now it needs to look for something else. Now, it's not like it's not possible. If you go back to the age sex match data, you still get 80% for sex classification on, on affinely registered data. So it's not that the, the, the features are there, but you don't pick them up anymore when the data is different and has um, site, uh, site bias. So that was quite interesting to see. Um, that was a little bit of an empirical analysis. So now how, how do we deal with this? Um, so I guess this is what this workshop is about. And, and there were lots of uh, papers uh, also at Mikai talking about domain adaptation. There were quite a few. Um, and, and that's one way of dealing with, with site differences, right? So, so we did this work, or Costas did this work, uh, one, of the, one of your chairs here, uh, on, on so-called feature level domain adaptation. And he used an unsupervised approach um, which basically uses adversarial training. So, so we have a network here that does a task. So this was image segmentation, right? So we wanted to do lesion segmentation and brain MRI. And what was added to that network is a domain discriminator, right? So a classifier that looks at the feature maps at different layers, and, and we did a nice analysis there, which layers do contribute the most. And, and it turns out that actually you want to like counter uh, the 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 feature um, specification to cite at, at different lay layers. Uh, but basically what it means, you train a domain discriminator uh, against the network to say, I don't want to be able to tell from the features that are learned for segmentation. I want to be, I, I don't want to be able to tell where the data is coming from, right? So you're countering this. And, and, and this should give you uh, domain agnostic features. 
And this works reasonably well. So, so on image segmentation, what our application was, was brain lesions, where interestingly our training data, uh, so this is TBI, traumatic brain injury, and, and you use different sequences for MRI here. Yeah? So we had a training data set where they used this gradient echo scan. And that is a protocol that shows microbleeds. So the doctors are very happy with the sequence because it shows the microbleeds. Now, at, at some point in the study, they decide, oh, there's this new sequence, SWI. It also shows microbleeds, but has like a little bit maybe higher image fidelity, like quality or image fidelity, and they switched. For them clinically, it didn't make a big difference. They said, oh, well, it's GE or SWI, we're looking for microbleeds. For machine learning, that was terrible because now your trained model that, that is supposed to see GE scans, gradient, gradient echo scans, suddenly sees this new modality that has no idea what to do with it. It's, it's like different, right? Domain shift. And the, the network completely fails. So what you see is um, the segmentation outputs uh, on this scan. So this is the ground, kind of ground truth, manual ground truth. Um, this is what the network was doing that was trained on gradient echo scans and now just sees a test on SWI. Now you could say, okay, maybe I can remove this modality, right? You can, and then you get better performance, but you're missing the microbleeds because you're removing the sequence that was made for detecting microbleeds. With the domain adaptation, you could actually train this on this data with gradient echo and still detect microbleeds on SWI, right? Exactly with this mechanism of doing domain adversary, uh, adversarial training. This is just another subject showing you that you can still detect these very small microbleeds now in this new modality or in this, this other modality that has been replaced. So this is really nice. Uh, so this works, this works reasonably well. Uh, in terms of numbers, um, so just so the main numbers here to look at is basically um, train on T means you're, you're staying, so you're on the target domain. So assuming you do have training data from your target domain, that's, that's um, probably like almost the best you can get. You can even combine it with your source data, which has different modalities and you get, you get even better dice cost, probably because you also have much more data to train on. But this is kind of the number we would like to reach. So, so not having training data on T, but being able to get to a performance as if we would have training data on T is what we almost achieve with this unsupervised domain adaptation method. And that's, that's quite promising. All right, so there are other works uh, who have done something similar, I guess. Um, there's, there's lots of work on unsupervised domain adaptation. I picked this one up just from the Mikhail proceedings. Um, so this is by Rosowski, uh, has been presented this year. It's kind of a, a, a variant of what we had done earlier um, where they say they do this test time specific. So they take a test image, not a test data set, but a test image and where they don't have ground truth and, and basically do the domain uh, discrimination on uh, at, at inference time. So they update the network weights. And additionally, they added another network that basically looked at perturbations of your test image so that um, you, you basically um, get the idea that you are robust to perturbations of the test image. And their argument is, so this is the sketch uh, from the paper that I copied is, so this is the source domain data. This is the target domain data. The domain discriminator that we also used earlier basically make, does, does this alignment of feature spaces. And this additional perturbation on the test data moves the decision boundary, they argue it moves it toward the low density area. So a little bit like this idea of using semi-supervised learning where you try to push things to low density areas. Um, and this is apparently what they, what they were able to do. And that seemed to seem to improve their results. Uh, we have also presented something this year uh, at Mikai, an update. Um, here we are not doing um, feature level domain adaptation, right? So these are the big dif differentiations, whether you want to make your features um, domain uh, invariant or agnostic to the side. Uh, here you can do it on the whole images, right? So, uh, so Rob was presenting this work uh, earlier where we used basically a combination of what we call an ITN and SDN. So ITN is basically an image transformer network. So image in, image out. You can implement this as a unit if you want. And SDN is a spatial transformer that, that produces a spatial transformation. And we chained them. So basically what this was doing is, is what we saw earlier. Um, we use a domain adversarial um, discriminator that says I have source data that is labeled on which I can train a task network. 
and I have unlabeled target data from, let's say, a new hospital where I want to uh, run my, uh, my network. So I run this stage of uh, domain adaptation or, or harmonization of the data by transforming the source data such that it matches more closely the distribution of the target data. And we wanted to do this not on the feature level. Here, here we wanted to test how far can we get if we do it on the image level, because that allows you to also get explainable or insights about what is the transformation that's happening, right? So you can look at the spatial transformation and the intensity transformations. What's promising, and this was basically run on the data that I showed earlier in our little empirical experiment on brain MRI coming from UK Biobank and ChemCam. And a similar setup, we, we use slightly more data here, so the numbers don't match exactly what I showed earlier. But similar in a sense that if you train on source data, test on source data, you get 84% for sex classification. If you train on source test on target, it drops dramatically. Like here it dropped down to 50, uh, 55. Uh, and then using this IT and STN image level harmonization, so mapping source data to the target distribution and then training a sex classification network and testing it on target, you go back up to 80. So, so that seems to be um, working okay. But it's a, it's a different approach, right? And, and I know there's a lot of discussion uh, whether you want to do feature level or image level, what are the differences, what are the, the um, caveats, uh, and um, that's maybe something we, could, we can discuss later. So, so if you look at these unsupervised domain adaptation techniques, they do work uh, to some degree, and that's nice. Uh, they don't need labels for the test domain where you want to adapt to. However, if you think about it, you basically would need to retrain uh, to each new test domain. And whether that's test time specific or pre, pre kind of the pre-processing harmonization step, that's painful, right? And, and, and that also means every time you get your new test domain, you would have to have to run some, uh, some update of your networks and, and that's maybe not ideal. So there's another approach. Uh, Chi Du was working on this uh, within our team on what's called domain generalization. What you try to do there compared to domain adaptation is you basically want to see if you can at training time already generalize to new domains that you have never seen. Uh, how do you do this? Uh, the, the idea is simple. It's not what we introduced here. This is what other people have done, is to you, you simulate domain shift during training. Now, for simulating domain shift, uh, there are many things you can do, but one, one assumption here is that we have two or more domains available at training time. Now, that's up for discussion. You could think about synthesizing these changes between domains, but let's say we do have data from two different domains. Uh, we can simulate domain shift during training already. Right? And we don't need to know about the, the domain where it will be later tested. So this was applied on a computer vision benchmark. So there's a benchmark for domain generalization called PUX, the PUX dataset, which has um, very different domains. Uh, so here the imaging domains are different uh, ways of, of uh, acquiring your data, if you want. But the categories are the same between the different domains. So we, here we have photo, art, cartoon, and sketch as the domains. And the class, the categories are doc, elephant, giraffe, so some object categories. So it's, a, it's an image level classification problem that you would run on, on the PAX data. So what, what did we do? Uh, so for domain generalization, what, what was proposed in this work uh, was uh, two things. So episodic training, uh, that is for simulating the domain shift at training time, and some new loss functions that take in global and local constraints on the feature uh, manifold, if you want, or in the feature representation, let's call it that way. So the first thing we do here is uh, we decompose our model. Uh, so if you think about the whole neural network predicting uh, class label, we, we basically say there is, a, there is a cut somewhere where we say this is what is the feature extraction part, and then you have the classification part, right? So the thing that takes the feature representation and maps it to your desired uh, target variables, um, for instance, the class categories. That would be the task network. And they, they have this interface, if you want, uh, this, this uh, representation right, that you learn and extract. So that's where the two are connected. Okay, so that's, that's, a, good, that's a useful view. Um, by the way, this is a view that all, was also um, advocated in the dream uh, tutorial by uh, Sotos, um, because I think it, 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 it's a very helpful uh, way of thinking about what's going on with the representations. So the episodic training works as follows. You take your domains, right? So this is a set, let's say two domains are in there, and you split them into meta-train and meta-test uh, domains. Uh, now, if you do a 
standard gradient uh, descent update on your network parameters. So this uh, feature extractor is, param is parameterized with these uh, parameters and the task network, network with these. Then you update them with one uh, step on your training domains, right? And now you get a new network. So this uh, uh, prime uh, parameter prime uh, network is, is your updated feature extractor and your updated task network. So on this one, we now uh, define two uh, loss functions. So the first one is a global class alignment. Um, and I'm trying to illustrate this with the sketch here, but there's also some math, um, but let's try to stay visual. Uh, for some people it's late in the afternoon. <laughs> um, so, so basically what's happening is here. So the feature extractor is, now, now this is the prime, right? So updated after one gradient step on the training domain. Now you take all your domains, the training and the test uh, domain, so the meta test and meta train, you pass them through your feature extractor. You know about where, from which domain they come. So let's say these are just two domains, I and J. You go into Z, right, into your feature space. You get all these little dots here. You average them per class. So what you do get is a class specific mean feature over your representation. So these are the big dots, uh, the, the, the big circles and the big triangles here. You only take those averaged feature representations, pass them through your updated task network, and then you look at the class relationships. So you're not looking directly whether you do a good uh, job or not in classifying, you just look at how they relate to each other, the tasks, uh, the, the, the different classes. Here's a red, a green, and a blue class. And all you're saying is now these class relationships should be similar between the domains. So your loss is looking at these two confusion matrices and says they should be similar. The intuition here is that you have a class in one domain uh, that should have relationships to the other classes in the same domain. And these relationships should be similar across domains. So for instance, an example would be a cat and a dog are closer in feature space than a dog in a house. And that should be true whether it's a photograph or a drawing. That's kind of the, the intuition of this uh, class alignment loss. Uh, we also take inspiration from uh, local sample clustering approaches, which basically look at the feature space and just say things should move together within a class, right? And across classes, things should be pushed away. So people have looked at this in different contexts, uh, semi-supervised learning, other representation learning works, and you can realize this with different types of losses, either a contrastive loss, we have heard about contrastive representation learning earlier. Uh, you can define a triplet loss, um, uh, but basically it's, it's just saying that the representations within classes should move together. And they should move together whether they come from different domains or not, right? So that, that gives you this, uh, things should come together when they belong to the same class in feature space. That's the intuition behind that. Now does it work? Um, so actually uh, we do uh, get uh, the best results on these benchmarks with this new approach that was published last year. So I'm pretty sure now you find papers that do better, but back then it was something that, that seems, to, seems to make a difference. So we compared this with lots of benchmarks and, and, and other domain generalization approaches. I don't have the time to talk about them in detail. What we did add, interestingly, which, which wasn't found in, in many of the other papers is a very simple baseline which we call deep all, which just takes uh, whatever you have in data, you just ignore they are different domains, you train a deep network and, and see how well it does. And, and interestingly, this simple baseline was better than some of the previously proposed domain generalization uh, approaches, which again is just a notion that we should be careful that we have the right baseline to compare with. Uh, we did an ablation study because I, I told you we, we, do, we did episodic training, which is this alternating between domains in, uh, for our gradient descent updates right? Uh, so that you can turn on or off. Uh, you can use the global and the local losses uh, or individually or combined. And in this ablation study, it turns out that using all of them was actually giving us the best numbers, which is nice. Now, here's the thing. So we move back to brain MRI, right? So the setting that I described earlier, you have some subtle changes between your scanners, uh, your images, and we wanted to see if this domain generalization helps us with brain segmentation. So we had scans from four different sites, so four different sets, different scanners. And we wanted to see if, if this approach can improve the segmentation performance. Guess what? It doesn't help a lot. It doesn't help a lot compared to a simple baseline, which just takes whatever is available and just trains one network. 
So if you have three sets of uh, data coming from three different sites, train a neural network, test on the fourth side, you get similar results to actually using our domain generalization. That we did get a slight improvement, but it's in a range where maybe it doesn't matter. So why is this happening? Um, so this domain generalization approach that I showed you makes a lot of assumptions, I guess, about what the differences are between domains. And here the differences are very subtle. So I think in medical imaging, we often have so subtle differences, but still important difference. We saw it in the brain lesion segmentation where it fails if you don't have any data from the, uh, from the uh, test domain. Um, but you might not need like these very complex um, approaches, contrastive learning, metric learning to get more robust models. Maybe you just need to collect data from different sites or you apply heavily robust, uh, uh, you, you apply a lot of data augmentation. Now, this is interesting, I think, uh, to think about that if you currently want to succeed, let's say in a challenge, you might just go with data augmentation still. Right? So we, we, have, we, we are seeing this at Nikai challenge. I don't know if people have followed this challenge, uh, multi-center, multi-vendor, multi-disease challenge. Uh, I guess another success from the DGFZ team. And, and, and they have a very well-engineered data augmentation pipeline. Um, and and, it, it, and it, it appears that this one was, uh, for instance, helping in getting this uh, cross-domain uh, robustness. Um, so this is an interesting one to discuss, I guess. Uh, how much effort should we make in terms of working on domain adaptation, domain generalization? Or should we focus on getting better approaches for data augmentation? I think at the moment, data augmentation is still something that's applied uh, sometimes a bit like empirically. Uh, we have to guess what type of transformations, how, what are the probabilities of flipping images around um, or adding, uh, adding noise. Um, I think if we would have a more principled way of doing this, maybe that's the way to go. But I think what, what is really important, what I want to get across, I don't know how much time I still have. <laughs> Costas, you need to tell me if I, if I do run uh, heavily over time. Uh, ben, uh, we have at least 45, so the room will close automatically in uh, 17, 20 minutes, in 20 minutes. All right. So, so I, I want to have time for questions, so, so let's see. That, but that should be fine. Um, so what, what I want to get across here is, so I, I'm not offering a solution to robustness. I, I don't know. We have worked on this. We, we found some things that do work. Sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, other people have found other things. There's lots of interesting work uh, around uh, learning invariant features and so on. But I think what, what I do want to get across is if we want to make proper progress um, besides uh, doing a random search for the best solution and for every challenge, I think we need to better understand what's going on with our data. And that alludes to some work we have been doing uh, around causality in a way that we use a causal perspective to look at what we call the data generating process. So this is a diagram that tries to illustrate uh, that things are not that easy. If you, if you just look at the images and what you want to predict, let's say a segmentation, then often we are only just looking at these two variables, right? The input images and the output uh, segmentations. But there are other things. There are other things that go on. Uh, the data doesn't fall from the sky. It has been acquired. Uh, there is a uh, uh, certain uh, demographics in your patient population, there are certain diseases, there are certain selection mechanisms. Uh, so a training data set is always a selected data set and it has been selected with some criteria. There are inclusion, exclusion criteria. There are things that, that go into creating such a data set. And we need to realize that this will bake in biases and that there will be data set shifts that we can anticipate. So if we map out in our clinical application what this process of generating the data looks like, maybe we can anticipate beforehand what type of shifts to appear. Do I need domain adaptation? Do I need domain generalization? Can I get away with data augmentation? How do I answer this? I need to better understand the causes of data set shift. And, and that's what we are trying to argue, I think, by bringing in this causal perspective. Just to give you an example, um, now before that, so, so just to tell you why this is interesting, so using this causal perspective allows you to map out the different types of shifts. So we gave them names um, that they had already names in machine learning, but we thought it might make sense to give them names that we can um, better relate to, and uh, also when we talk to, to clinical collaborators and so on. So for instance, taking the causality into account, whether you predict from an image to a target variable, uh, or you have um, the opposite causal direction where the target variable is actually um, causing the image, 
Um, so you need to take this into account and this will uh, relate to different changes in your distribution. So if you take your data distribution, right, um, then you have different uh, sub distribution, marginals and conditionals that are differently affected depending on what type of shift you have. And I think that is important to understand. So this is just mapping out that there are different types of shifts, obvious ones like acquisition shift, right? If your scanner changes, your domain changes, your hospital changes, your image changes. Uh, you can have changes on the patient population. You can have annotation shift. Let's say you have a multi-center study and different experts annotating in, in the US and in the UK and in China at the same time. And if they don't follow like very standardized uh, operating procedures, you might get an annotation shift. Uh, and, and that's really tricky to deal with. But realizing what types of shift are present then helps you to understand what type of mitigation strategies you can apply. Uh, same for sample selection, as I, as I said, if you get a training data set, whether it's downloading it from a challenge, whether it's getting it from your clinical collaborators because it's secondary use, they have already collected the data for another clinical study, there was sample selection going on, right? And that, that can be done based on um, the images, right? You might do quality control, you might discard all the images with poor quality, it might be target dependent, so let's say you do it based on the disease label, you can do both. Or you do completely random, which is rarely the case, um, but that, that would be the ideal. So these, these will result in biases, right? So I, I will skip over this now, but just remember sample selection is, is one big contributor to, to your biases in your training data. And just to illustrate this with one example, skin lesion classification. Think about you have images, dermoscopic images and biopsy derived diagnosis as a training set. Let's say there's a Kaggle challenge where you get this data set, skin lesions, biopsy derived diagnosis. And people say, let's get people to build machine learning methods so we can use this for screening uh, skin cancer. That's probably not going to work. Just thinking about the causal diagram, the data generating process, there is a disease, the disease causes the image, but what's happening then? Who gets biopsy? Not everyone, you don't do this randomly, you don't, you don't do biopsy on healthy people. So they might have been a suspicion in the first place on the image. They, these are sent to biopsy. Then you have positives and negatives. If you use this data set for training, it will not work on a screening population because you get completely different, uh, you get data set shift, right? So you haven't seen the ones that are completely normal because they don't get biopsy. So I, I want to conclude here and then hopefully we still have some time for discussion. So I don't think the quest is, is, is done. It, it does continue. Uh, I think one way forward is to try to model the data generating process from the ground up and causality can help with that. And maybe one solution next year is uh, that we see many approaches trying to do a hybrid, like test specific data augmentation with domain adaptation and generalization or something completely different um, that, that I can currently not think of. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. I think it's still an exciting, uh, exciting field uh, to make progress there. Thanks very much. And uh, looking forward to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, I guess I will open up to the audience for questions or co-hosts. In uh, the meantime, I can definitely start the discussion. Um, something that I'm interested in, uh, your one, you mentioned it uh, towards the end of the talk about uh, the strength of uh, data augmentation and I would like us to discuss certainly the connection between data augmentation, pre-processing even, which are, I consider basically engineered domain annotation. So when we understand the domain shift, we can engineer it, we can model it, we can create either pre-processing to take it away or augmentation to uh, counter it by augmentation versus learned domain annotation. So basically, where do you see from your experience, where do you see going forward? Perhaps from your experience on medical imaging, what types of domain shifts you have, you have seen successfully being um, modeled, what are not easy to model and so on and so forth. So I think for data augmentation, I think it's an interesting one because I mean, there are now very nice and exciting works talking about learning data augmentation. Um, now you bring in a new learning problem. <laughs> this, uh, this new learning problem of learning data augmentation comes with the same caveats as, as learning the primary task in the first place. So you build in bias, bake in biases and so on. So I don't know um, whether, whether that's the way forward. Um, 
I think it could be could be quite interesting to to look at what you I, I guess said is um, what are the successful cases where we saw modeling coming in. I I don't know, but I think there are ways of bringing in physics, uh, right? So I mean, the MRI physicist should be the one you should talk to when it comes to MRI domain adaptation. Uh, maybe we sometimes don't do this enough. I do, I mean, anecdotally, I, I know that some companies who face exactly this problem, uh, deploying a product in a hospital that has a different scanner than they had seen before, scanners get upgraded. They employ MRI physicists that go in and do measurements on the scanners and, and do calibration. And, and you adjust your algorithms to that hospital and you model, like you do, you get a physical model of your, of your scanner. Maybe that's the way forward. I don't know if, it's, if that scales. Um, that's that's a good question. I I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, we have a question from the audience, Bella Spector Padida. Would you like to address Ben? Yes, I saw it. Um, so so I guess it's probably a question for you. Even you you have worked on the brain lesion MRI one, and I think so. Why do we do domain adaptation? Because we don't want to. So why do we do unsupervised domain adaptation? Because maybe we don't want to or cannot collect labels on the test domain. I mean, from your experience, Kosa, I, I guess there's nothing that beats getting labels on your target domain. <laughs> and if you, if you can, if you can afford it and you can, you can uh, even annotate just a few, right? Another 10, 20 images from your target domain. Yes, <laughs> do it. <laughs> um, so we find if you can't, then um, domain adaptation can, can really work. I mean, I, I, was, I was super surprised that you can replace the GE scan with an SWI scan, and you you still get these uh, these small lesions. I think this was pretty impressive. But as I said, it's not again scalable, right? If you need to do this for every every time they change their mind because they want to acquire a new protocol. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. There's another one from Shadi. Hi, Shadi. Um, this is on the global class. However, what happens if you don't have the prior what classes? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's work on these open set problems, right? Open set classification. Maybe that's that's one. Maybe the the solution is somewhere there. I don't know. So in, in our case, we we assume you do know the classes. Yes. Um, A question from Andrew King. Yeah. Um, would you like Andrew? Would you like to perhaps put, clarify the question yourself? Perhaps? Yeah. Okay. And I'm just wondering, is, is the whole thing about domain adaptation, is it just because we don't have enough data? So if we had enough annotated data from any domain that we, we might be interested in, does the whole problem go away or is there something more fundamental that it can help with? I think it depends on the type of shift. Um, so this is, I think, going back to my point that there are different types of shift, right? So if you talk about acquisition shift, so MR, different scanners, Maybe at some point we have so much data or we can collect enough data from all different vendors and scanners and that we can interpolate between all these spaces well enough. Maybe maybe that that's fine then if we collect enough data. Um, I would still be worried a little bit changes that are like shifting outside the domain. So we know we can interpolate well, but we are terrible in extrapolating with these methods. So if you know suddenly change. So I don't know, for instance, if you go from 1.5 Tesla to 3 Tesla, whether that's something that you can deal with by by just collecting enough data on 1.5 and you will be fine whenever you move to 7 Tesla or whether you need to start collecting more data. I think the other types of shifts, if you think about population shifts, um, I mean, thinking now five, 10 years ahead, maybe the your patient population really changes, right? Like dramatically, maybe they, they come with different phenotypes and so on. And, and maybe we have to continuously collect data about that. I, I don't know. Um, I guess for many current applications, the pra pragmatic way is to collect just right as much data as you can and, and hope that you stay in the interpolation uh, space, but yeah. Um, an interesting question that I think it may also have, so two questions that are related, I think. One is from Katharina Breininger and one is from Sadi. I think they have both the question uh, that relates on what types of domain adaptation probably can be used 
together with Federated Learning. Katarina, perhaps you would like to um, ask the question yourself? No? Okay, I can read it. Many of the methods presented require the source domain to be available during training. Do you think that this may be an issue in terms of data privacy? And similar to the question from Sadi is what kind of domains it may be a good serious problem in federated learning. So if you basically think about domain adaptation in federated learning or when you don't have all the sources in your hand, perhaps you have decentralized. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I have a good answer to that, but but yeah, I mean spot on. If you if you if your method requires access to the source data still, I mean you can think about these continual learning problems, right? Where you say something is pre-trained, you ship it, you never need to touch the source data again. And then you're dealing with all these problems of catastrophic forgetting. How do you make sure that you're not losing the features that were key because you just do domain adaptation, right? I mean, there's, for instance, work, I, I don't, that's not a clear answer to your question because I don't know one, but, but there's work on this showing that in certain situations, domain adaptation is really bad. Uh, and, and, and can make it really worse. Um, and, and that's when you, for instance, have concept shifts, so slight differences in how classes or class labels represent themselves in the, in the images or in the data. If you dare do domain adaptation and you align features, your decision boundaries will be bad on both domains and, and you actually make it really, really uh, bad there. So there are some papers even with theoretical guarantees showing that. Uh, so yeah, if you can't access your data, you, I think that that's even worse. <laughs> so I guess federated learning and domain adaptation is another whole big like challenge for us. Um, let's see, there was, um, I hope this answers something. Um, we have uh, five more minutes to answer um, perhaps a couple more questions. I'll have to choose a little bit because they're coming. So perhaps not one that I know that you will like it is given to data sets. Uh, could causality help us determine whether it makes sense at all to go for domain adaptation? Yeah, I do. Uh, is there an adaptability measure? I actually think the domain adaptation is very closely related to causality. Yeah. So, so I think so. Remember, so causality itself is uh, is is so so there are, there's not an algorithm that would directly um, you would just run it on the data and it tells you. The way you would use causality is to map out your your application. For instance, you draw this diagram that I showed you. And then you can identify, yes, uh, whether you might want to do domain adaptation. So going back to this uh, diagram, so I'm happy to share that paper later, but with the different types of shifts that you can identify, it tells you which uh, part of your distribution is affected. And, and for some parts, domain adaptation is the wrong thing to do. Sometimes you just do re-weighting, right? So uh, re-weighting on the loss, or you do a test time, you have to re-weight, for instance, a prevalence shift. Uh, population shift is another interesting one. Population shift in theory is no problem for domain adaptation be, be, because you learn the mechanism of going from say, from a subset of your data for which you have data to the target labels. And now if your population changes, um, these mechanisms that you have learned are still valid. The problem is if you have now mapped or if you missed some part of your distribution. So you don't need domain adaptation there, you need something like so yes, causality can help you in identify um, what strategy to go for, I think. So So if I may add to this, uh, I would say domain adaptation is extremely related to um, um, causality in the sense that so generative models are said to be finding causal factors of the generative process, right? So essentially what you do with domain adaptation, you try to become invariant to one of them to the specific one that you specify in the domain discriminator, the domain, the domain label. So yeah, I would say it's the same as if in a causality framework, if you do have the, the label, you learn it in a causal deep generative model, for example, and then you say, take it out. Uh, so there is a talk actually from Arhofsky and his, um, the, the person that did the Basel study and um, his uh, supervisor about the link between, I think, the main variants and the uh, result. Um, I just want to pick up one question about the domain generalization. Just, just a, a uh, so, so the so you 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 have domain. So you have meta train and meta test. Uh, that's not your holdout test set. So what you do is you 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 have more than two domains. You have three domains at least. Two of them you use during training. One you call meta train. One you call meta test. And those are alternating in the episodic training. There is still a holdout test set that you that you use to do the final evaluation, just as a clarification. 
There was another one on regression uh, further up. Um, good question. Uh, we have seen with the work with Rob on image level harmonization, we did a regression task for age prediction. And um, it was slightly different, the picture. It was less easy to do the domain adaptation, to actually get better with the domain adaptation. I don't know if it has to do with the regression task in general or with a specific age regression, but it's interesting. It might be interesting to look into this a bit further. I'm a bit uh, worried about time. I don't know when it, this will be cut off. It will be cut off in three minutes, so you will allow me. Uh, there are a couple more questions. I don't know if we can just log them and take them afterwards, perhaps answer by email. I will try this. I will try this. In the meantime, um, I will thank you. I will thank um, you, Ben, a lot. Um, and I will... Um, this was the end, basically, of the third session of um, that. I have to say that there are there is the poster session coming up for 15 minutes or so. You, you should go meet the... You can and should go meet live the four um, presenters of the four uh, papers that were presented in this oral session. Visit them, discuss with them your work. The poll is still running for the best paper award. Please go ahead and vote afterwards your favorite uh, work. And we're coming back in roughly 55 minutes, I think, 50 for the last session. That is the best paper award uh, for that, sponsored by NVIDIA. And um, the concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you all.